Well, thanks to everybody that's in the Zoom conference tonight, the live stream on our YouTube channel. How many we got in there right now? I don't know. We've got uh, 36. Yeah, so we got, no, there's 22 on YouTube right now, 36 on, on uh, 35, 36 here on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, and so thanks for that and everybody that came from Meetup. And uh, we kind of went through our list of stuff. Let me just tell you about our speaker tonight. Dr. Bob Dempsey, he received his PhD in astrophysics from the University of Toledo in 1991. Go Mud Hens, right? Still the Mud Hens there? I think so, yeah. In 1997, he joined NASA's International Space Station Program, where he controlled the computer and communication systems on the ISS. And in 2005, he was selected as a flight director, his call sign Galileo. And in his role, he supported numerous space shuttle assembly missions, spacewalks, rendezvous, and dockings of autonomous or crewed vehicles and supported a lot of shifts in mission control. For 10 years, he led the operations team that developed and operated the Boeing Starliner crewed vehicle. And I was so just, and I was telling him beforehand, I was so excited thinking about him as we saw Starliner, Starliner finally lift off and, and do in just almost perfect, so great. And in 2022, he retired from NASA and then joined the mysterious Blue Origin, serving as the Director of Mission Systems and Flight Operations for the Orbital Reef Space Station Program. Please welcome back for the third time, Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob Dempsey, welcome back, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Okay, first of all, let me apologize. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I apparently had a sinus infection and I'm still kind of coughing a little bit. I'll try to mute before I cough into your ears, but uh, when I'm talking, it kind of comes up a little bit, so I apologize for that. So, let's see, let me, whoop, where'd the share screen go? Always doing that too. If you guys have any questions, uh, please type them into chat. We'll try and uh, ask them for you. Uh, you, can, you can also chat on YouTube. We'll be looking at that or right here, and then we'll uh, relay those on to Dr. Bob. Okay, are you seeing the screen? Yes. Okay, today I wanted to talk to you about, uh, uh, as, as mentioned there, I used to operate the computers on the International Space Station. So I wanted to talk to you about an incident that happened early uh, in the time frame when we were building the space station. And uh, I titled this the blue screen of death. Uh, we don't see that that much anymore on computers, but uh, it was the equivalent of, of that sort of situation. And uh, uh, I include here a picture of astronaut Susan Helms, uh, obviously doing some reading on how to operate the space station computer. So we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Uh, now, wait a second, though. Before I get into my talk, I did want to explain a little bit of backstory on the T-shirt that I was wearing in the picture that you had in the promo. And because um, I think there's there's few people in the world that appreciate this story, and I think you guys are in that category. So around 1982, when I was a, a college student in astronomy class, uh, our professor was giving a lecture and he started talking about the Wilson-Bapu effect. And uh, our ears perked up and we said, well, that sounds like a, a cool name for a rock band or a t-shirt. Um, mm -hmm. So the 10 of us uh, made a t-shirt of the Wilson-Bapu effect, which correlates the, the calcium two line width with uh, absolute magnitude. And uh, uh, one day he came into class and we were all wearing those, you know, the astronomy geeks that we were, and, you know, we thought it was funny. Uh, fast forward a few years, uh, I'm in graduate school and um, we were listening to a colloquium by a speaker and someone asked a question and he uh, went on a tangent into the Wilson-Bapu effect and he was like, dang it, I wish I had a slide on it. I just happened to be wearing the shirt and my advisor made me stand up in the front of the colloquium so the speaker could point on my shirt and show you know, what he was talking about. Well, it turned out he was a postdoc of uh, Olin Wilson's. And he had to have a few of the shirts. So we did a second run and I made a few shirts, gave them to him. And about six months later, I get a phone call from Dr. Olin Wilson, who was wearing his shirt and he thought it was the coolest shirt he had ever gotten. And then about a year later, I got a letter from uh, the widow of Dr. Bapu. Uh, he had passed away just a, about a year or so before. And when she got the shirt, she thought it was just an awesome uh, reflection of his legacy, and she really appreciated it. So 
um, some friends and I, I, I was cleaning out some drawers lately and I, I found it and I put it on and sent it to my friends from that class. Unfortunately, of 10 of us, I was the only one that actually continued in astronomy, um, but I wanted to show them that it still fit. Yes. Okay, so let's get on to our program. Let's see, hang on here. And just so I'm in sync, are you guys seeing the, uh, it's got a quote from Doc, uh, from Gene Kranz from This Day Forward? Is that yep. the same yeah, slide you're seeing? Now. Okay. Um, so Gene Kranz was the father of flight directors. And this is a quote from his book from 2000, but it actually is something that he wrote on a blackboard back here in Johnson Space Center in 1967. And what happened there was that was when the Apollo 1 fire occurred where three astronauts were killed on the launch pad during a ground test uh, in Florida. And, you know, it was a, uh, a humbling and painful experience for the flight control team back here in Houston. Um, you always want to be able to save the day. Apollo 13 is a classic example. Um, that movie is so accurate that we used it for years in training. Um, because it really kind of illustrated both uh, how you have to be flexible and put it together and how, you know, literally uh, Gene Kranz doesn't know if he actually ever said failure is not an option, but it is the, the flight ops credo these days. We, we say it all the time. But what he wrote here was um, right after this was uh, a few days after the fire that from this day forward, flight control will be known by two words, tough and competent. Tough means that we are forever accountable for what we do or what we fail to do. We will never again compromise our responsibilities. Every time we walk into mission control, we will know what we stand for. That was a very important point to make sure that you are always ready and willing to do what needed to be done. And competence, competent means we will never take anything for granted. We will never be found short in our knowledge and our skills. Mission control will be perfect. And from 67 on, this was uh, tough and competent was our official motto uh, before failure is not an option. And we, we lived and breathed this uh, day to day. So let's talk a little bit about the computer system on the space station. Um, it had what we called a tiered structure. Uh, tier one and MDM, I probably should have put that uh, uh, acronym out here is multi Plexer demultiplexer, and just think of it as a computer. Um, it just takes uh, data in and puts out different data. Um, and tier one MDMs are, are command and control. They operate everything on the space station. They, they are the, the, the king of the, of, the, of the computers. Then you have your tier two MDMs, uh, which is kind of an intermediary computer that what it'll do is it collects all the data from the tier three computers and then issues commands to what we call firmware controllers. And firmware controllers or effectors are basically a fan. You turn a fan on and off, a valve, you open the valve. Uh, and of course, sensors are pressure sensors, temperature sensors. So these are all effected through the tier three, uh, collected by the tier two and passed up to the tier one. And this tier one is then our telemetry link to our mission control. Uh, it also is our connection to the crew's laptop. Uh, we called it a portable computer system or PCS. And this was basically the crew's interface to the vehicle. They could do anything just about that the ground control, but you needed these, one of these two guys talking to that computer to operate the space station. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the details of here, but uh, this gives you a little bit idea um, of the type of computers we're talking about. Uh, that tier one were all what we call enhanced uh, computers and the other ones were what we call standard. Um, they, they processed at either 12 megahertz or 16 megahertz for those that are familiar with it. They had a little uh, memory, a little dynamic memory, <laughs> um, and they had some other equipment. Um, but uh, probably for those of us that are a little uh, older, you're probably looking at this upper left-hand corner here. And you're going an 8386 chip. Good grief. Um, you can't even buy a phone that dumb anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, don't laugh. It, it, it got the job done. Remember, all it's really supposed to do is pass data back and forth, commands back and forth. And it was sized for the, the task that it was assigned to. 
So uh, here's a picture of one of these computers. Um, and it's a silver box, and that's because it's in a protective box. I'll show you the inside here in a moment. Uh, this is an example of that command and control computer, um, which was that, that enhanced one. Um, but you also notice a little verbiage here, or PL. And what that is, is uh, it's a payload computer. Um, those were to you know, work with the science experiments and stuff. And they were the only other computer that was in function and form the same as the command and control, but obviously it had different operating software. And that'll come up back later. And here's what it looks like on the inside. A lot familiar to you if you've ever uh, taken apart a desktop computer um, where you've got cards in there. Uh, some of these cards are computing cards. Uh, some of them are you know, math processing, uh, different types of uh, computer cards here. And then over here in the far right, you'll see something that looks very familiar to a lot of us, a hard drive. And this is where the, uh, the, the software was loaded. You know, so when it booted up, this is, you know, it spun up, read the hard drive, and then uh, uh, began the operations, um, just like uh, any desktop that you used in those days. This eye chart is, uh, 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 shows all the connections. You know, I, I mentioned that there was three command and control. Uh, they are triply redundant. They are completely identical. And the purpose of having three of them is if one fails for whatever reason, you've got two more. And if a second one should fail, you've still got one. Um, so you've got that nice redundancy so that uh, you're, you're covered for just about any scenario. And you probably can't read all these other, but these are all the different computers around the station uh, that control everything from the solar arrays to the thermal loops uh, and so on, uh, all underneath these uh, command and control computers. And by the way, I can't see the chat. So if someone has a question, you know, if someone could just yell it out or something, that, that's fine. Um, so let me just focus in on uh, the structure a little bit. So these are the command and control ones that I'm talking about. You had your internal computers, as they were called, which controlled all the laboratory. That's what labs. So all your everything that was in the pumps, valves, powers, payloads, everything was under here. You also had a guidance navigation and control computer, a power module converter unit, an external computer that dealt with all the things on the external side of the station, and the payloads. Now, also in the upper right-hand corner, you're going to see a small set of two computers here called the node computers. And uh, they are a special computer that was part of the assembly. And they could talk to the same computers. And something you'll hear me refer to is a term called bus controller. And basically what that means is one computer can be a bus controller. And what that means is it talks on these data buses to these other computers. And kind of like uh, Highlander, there can only be one. So another thing that we're going to be talking about today is something called Mighty Mouse. And again, um, some of us may remember growing up watching Mighty Mouse, uh, an old black and white cartoon where uh, um, this uh, goofy little mouse would always, in the end, come and save the day. So he's an important character today. Why is that? Well. These computers were designed, remember, only one could be um, active at a time. And we designed this, this system such that if these guys are sitting out here and they, they basically do some low level function control of what was called the node module, also known as unity module. And if they're sitting out there and they're like, hey, dude, you know, talking to the other one, we haven't heard from these guys in a while, something's wrong. So what would happen is if they say, hey, there's no one out there, they would transition to what we call operational and take control of this bus. And then they would say, OK, let's power cycle the first computer. And then take itself out of bus controller, because remember, there can only be one. And he, they would go back down and say, OK, now I'm going to wait and then listen. Do I see a computer out there? And if yes, all is good. If no, power cycles the second one and does the same thing. And then if there's still no computer in charge, it does the third one. And then when it sees that it goes to standby. So you've got three chances where these computers will try to uh, power cycle these guys. And it actually does this twice. 
because uh, you know how sometimes computers are, if you power cycle at once, it may not completely come back the first time. So we do this twice and we, uh, I helped uh, develop this software. Um, it was uh, one of the earliest tasks I had when I joined the space station program. And because these were the big powerful computers that would run everything. And these were kind of these little pipsqueak computers out here. Uh, and if they powered cycled this, we referred to this as the mighty mouse algorithm because these little guys were recovering the big guys. Okay, um, now that was the concept before we launched anything. And then when we started to figure out, well, wait a second, how do we actually activate a space station? And you know that's a whole talk on itself, but you've got this lab module that was delivered by the space shuttle, and uh, it's got its three command and control computers. But of course, they're powered off. You know, they're they're just payload. And like a tinker toy, we attach this to the space station, which at that time was mostly the node and some solar rays. Um, and these computers had already been up there for a couple of years, just controlling, keeping this thing warm and comfy. Um, and you know, basic telemetry. So somehow we had to transition from these guys running the station to the new permanent kings, and this was this. But as I said, there can only be one. So we had to figure out, well, how do you turn these guys off and turn these guys in sequence? Well, you're probably ahead of me on this. It's like, hmm, this sounds a lot like the Mighty Mouse algorithm. So what we decided to do was um, basically use that same algorithm where we would basically tell these guys, it's like, okay, you should be monitoring for these other guys. Do you see them? No, we'll start going through your algorithm. And in this way, they did exactly that, powered up these computers, the first one, on what we call lab, act lab activation. Um, and then we could connect a, a portable computer system and the crew could tell it, okay, now power up the second one and we were good to go. And then we worked out the rest of the lab, you know, power on the electrical systems, the thermal systems, the guidance systems and so forth. So this is how we kind of bootstrapped that system up. Um, now, one key thing here is uh, these nodes computers, when they talked to the, the crew's laptop, they actually used a special different software because these were different computers. It was called the early PCS or EPCS. And then basically what I said, if it doesn't see that, it turns that on. And then if yes, uh, the crew connect to their normal portable computer system and we're good to go. And if not, it would do the second one. Okay, so that was the design. And, um, you know, some days small things can happen that you don't realize really what they mean. Uh, and later on you go, oh. So uh, this was an example of it. I was down at the Kennedy Space Center performing what we call multi-element integrated testing. And this is where they basically took every module of the space station and stuck them together and made sure they worked and they activated and we practiced them. And uh, uh, we did this for, God, like a, a year and a half before we launched anything to make sure everything was ready. And we're sitting around and we're doing some tests and suddenly the, the command and control computer locks up just, you know, as, and, and, and this was the early days of the software. So people were still writing the software. They'd run it a while, things would crash. They'd go, wow, that didn't work. And they would modify it. So one of these things happened where the, the computer crashed and uh, we're like, hmm, that's interesting. So the test team there at Kennedy Space Center, they leaned over and we said, eh, this happens a lot. We'll just power cycle the computer. So they do that, they power it off and then they start doing paperwork because this is NASA. There's all kinds of paperwork where you have to go through a process uh, because of course a computer going down is a deviation from the planned tests. So we had to document it, make sure we understood it. And they're doing that and that takes about 30 minutes or so. And then suddenly after about 26 minutes, one of the CNCs pop up. And the test conductor looks at me and says, what the heck? That weird thing happened again where the computer suddenly rebooted itself. What is this Phoenix thing that's going on there? And I looked over and I said, wait a second, that was 26 minutes? That was Mighty Mouse. Mighty Mouse was doing exactly what it was supposed to. And they were like, oh, okay, well, that's good to know. And you know, they documented that uh, Mighty Mouse worked that day and we moved on and completed our test. So, um, time goes by, we start launching International Space Station parts, and uh, you can tell by the title of my slide, things are not going to be good this day, um, because something that the engineers assured us over and over just can't possibly happen. 
And what am I getting at? Well, um, we had three CNC computers because you know one or two can fail and you're still good. There's no way in heck all three could fail. Well, in 2001, we were on the sixth uh, US assembly mission to install the robotic arm. Uh, the lab module had been installed uh, a few months before and the robotic arm was our new toy that we were attaching and that was critical to get all the new modules after that attached because uh, you needed you needed that arm to put each module in place and i'm at home and a little after midnight i get a phone call uh, from my on console counterpart because i was in charge of the cnc computers and the software at this time and he said hey the cnc computer reported its hard drive had failed and took itself out of operation just wanted you to know that. I'm like, okay, well, that was a little odd because these were essentially brand new computers that had only in space a, a, a couple months uh, and the hard drive had failed. Um, hmm, that's not good, but we had two more. Uh, the second one was up and operating. They were running my procedures to reconfigure and clean everything up. No problem. I told them I'll be in the morning to help you diagnose and see what's going on. Well, uh, a little time after that, the second one starts in enunciating these alerts and saying, hey, I'm having trouble accessing my hard drive. Um, now, it wasn't a failure, but it was like it's, it's you know, and again, if you've had a desktop in the past, you may have encountered similar things where it's like, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to get to it. Please just give me a moment, but I'm having trouble getting to it. Um, so the team decided to send what's called a reset command, which is basically kind of power cycling just the hard drive, not the whole computer. And uh, um, uh, that didn't work. We continue to have these problems. So we said, okay, let's command it uh, out of operational. Let's take it to the standby mode. So it's, it's still there, but it's not in control. And we'll let the third one take over because um, it had actually never been used in space. And as soon as it took over, it said, hey, my hard drive isn't even there. I, I can't talk to it all. Not failed, not there. I don't know. Can't talk to it. So we're like, uh, this is not good. <laughs> so we tried to do a reset on that command, on that computer. It's like, what are we going to do? We're down to our third one. Let's see what that does. Um, we lost everything. We literally sat there in the dark. We had no data from the vehicle. Um, and I can, I can honestly tell you, this is one of those moments where you are, um, let's just say, uh, releasing a number of bricks from the rear side. Um, you know, you're sitting there and you're like, you, you've never seen this, you've never trained for it, this can't happen. Uh, what the hell are we going to do? So it happened. Um, the crew couldn't connect their laptops. Uh, we suspected that that third MDM was in some hung state um, and we didn't know what was gonna happen. So what do I mean by a hung state? Well, it didn't come out of operational or something. The node computers didn't take over. Um, so it's, it's probably in what, you would, what I would say is a computer controller, the worst case scenario. You know, if it had failed, you might have another option. If it was working, things are good. If it's hung, you don't know what's going on. So since we thought it might still be operating, um, we... Uh, I guess a, a key thing I should mention here, the thing that kind of also saved our butt here was we did have the space shuttle docked to the space station. That's how we, we just delivered the robotic arm. Um, so we could still talk to the crew through the space shuttle. Um, and what we decided to do is the, the antennas, of course, if the CNC wasn't working, the antennas might be just frozen in space. And we could say, hey, look, it looks like it's going to be now pointing to the relay satellite let's send a command up and see if it gets through and operates. Well, what command can we send up to see if we've got an end item? Let's turn on a light. So we would, we would send light on, light on, light on, light on, and we'd wait for the crew to call down for the shuttle and say, hey, the light's on. And that happens. And we're like, okay, so it is there. It is somewhat there. So then we tried light off, light on, light off, light on. Um, and, uh, and of course, when that happened, when we saw that was working, we said, we got a link, let's try some other commands. Let's check the hard drive, let's do this, whatever. And not a whole lot was working, um, uh, but we were, we were trusting things. We were getting a little bit of data, we were making improvements, we were trying to figure out what the state was. And then a really nasty thing happened. 
the crew went to bed and hard powered off the light switch. So we had to sit there until it was time to wake up the crew, you know, because we, we didn't have our light switch. We kept trying and sometimes we got some commands through, but, you know, having a light there was really nice. So when we were confident, we knew what was going on and we could command the vehicle. And after the crew was awake and we did our light switch test again, we decided to just power off the CNC3. Remember, the second one was in standby. And by the way the code was written, um, when you power off the third one, it should say, hey, there's no one in control. It should transition and come back and at least be where it was when we told it to, to uh, go. So unfortunately, that happened. And then when we tried to activate the telemetry link from that computer, we lost it. And this time we lost everything. And we, we knew that we, 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 we didn't have a hung computer here. We don't know what was going on. So we sat there waiting and waiting and waiting. Something else I forgot to tell you. Without a CNC MDM, we can't talk to the space station from mission control. We can only talk to the space shuttle. We can't even control the attitude or the solar arrays. Um, we can't release the docking clamps for the shuttle to undock. So in other words, we could not undock the space shuttle. Uh, now the orbiter was still controlling our attitude because the station was small enough in these days that it, it could do that. Um, but the space shuttle only had consumables for about 10 days and we were halfway through this mission. So, even before we were trying to figure out what to do here, we knew we, the, talk, the clock was ticking. Uh-oh, I also forgot to tell you something else. So I don't know if the name Dennis Tito rings a bell for you, but he was the first paying tourist to the International Space Station. And it's something the Russians had to deal with. Now the United States by law, uh, back in those days, we could not do commercial operations. We can't do commercials. That's why you don't see Pizza Hut on the side of uh, uh, rockets. Um, we, we couldn't do paying customers. Uh, you know, that's changed now with law changes, but back then. And uh, the, the Russians, you know, trying to make money, wanted to launch this uh, rich tourist. And for months, NASA was saying, hey, we don't want to do this. We really think it's the right time for a tourist. You know, we're still kind of doing assembly, maybe down the road. Why don't you, why don't you sit on it and think about it? Um, so Russia, of course, was thinking that they were just tired of the stalling tactics and figured if we came back and said, hey, please don't launch uh, Dennis Tito, which we did at this point, they were like, nah, we're tired of this. You know, he's paid his money. He's coming. Okay. Well, I probably wouldn't have told you anything about Mighty Mouse if I didn't think that uh, he helped us out here. And sure enough, he did. So after that uh, third computer, when we tried to activate it and things went dark a second time, uh, we waited. And uh, sure enough, uh, we were able to, it had power cycled and one of the computers was there. Its hard drive was not functional, um, but it was there working okay. So we were like, whew. We've got a lifeline now. So we've got one computer in control, but it doesn't have a healthy hard drive. These two are failed. Um, so what we did is, remember I mentioned earlier, those payload computers were uh, hardware wise the same. Well, we said, sorry, scientists, uh, we're gonna take away all your data. And we took out one of their hard drives and we decided to uh, uh, turn it into a hard drive for the CNC. So we had to reformat the disk and load the, off, uh, load the operating software. software. Now, that sounds straightforward. Um, a lot of us have probably reformatted a disk. It's a command. Uh, to give you an idea, it took about eight hours uh, to reformat the hard drive. Um, and of course, it was buggy software. So the first time it did it, it failed at about seven hours and 15 minutes and we had to restart it. Uh, so we did that again. And then we had to load the software to the RAM the active dynamic memory, because obviously it couldn't read any real software from the hard drive. And um, we had to load that. Now, the, the, we can only do like it's 172 kilobits per second is the radio link. So you're really doing a small chunk of bytes at a time. And we're talking about, now I know this doesn't sound like a lot now, uh, but one megabyte of uh, software um, and doing it at a few bits per second 
uh, is very long. And of course, the same sort of thing. You'd be loading the software and you'd be getting it there. And then, of course, you'd have some radio glitch that would garble the signal. And, and you know, as what happened, and you'd have to start over. So we did this painfully over and over and over. And eventually, once we got the software, we did what's called a reboot from RAM, the, the, that dynamic memory. And it came up. Well, we've got one computer up. We also didn't know how long that hard drive was going to last because apparently they were a little finicky. Um, so we did the same process with the second CNC. Now, of course, it wasn't quite as slow because we didn't have to use that little radio link on the shuttle. Uh, we could use the space station's big radio link because now we had one CNC computer controlling it. Um, so the second one went a little bit faster. So once we had two CNC MDMs up, uh, and operating again, we were able to undock the shuttle. Um, and then literally like later that day, we docked the Soyuz with Dennis Tito in it. Um, and they had to go in that sequence. We couldn't have them. And those days we couldn't have them docked at the same time. So it was very tight choreography. And believe me, it wasn't like we, we rebuilt that second MDM and we kind of sat around for a day or two patting our backs. Uh, we immediately went into the, uh, uh, undocking procedure and stuff like that. So it literally was down to hours um, before uh, we got into position and let that Soyuz dock. Um, and then over the next few weeks, we built a third one. Uh, this is where the astronauts come in handy on orbit, you know, kind of putting these things together. And then finally, on the next shuttle mission, we launched completely new hard drives, something we're all familiar with today, solid state mass memory units. Now, these actually were in work, uh, you know, uh, the, the thing and, you know, I, I didn't get into it with the 386 chips. Um, but when you build space hardware, by the time you design it, um, review it, all that stuff, test it, build it, launch it, operate it, many years go by. Um, so, you know, by the time we launched those 386 chips, yep, Intel Pentium ones were already the standard, but they weren't. Uh, radiation hardened, they weren't tested, they weren't planned, but we were in the process of planning to upgrade to them someday. Um, but these solid state drives were in process. Um, so we greatly accelerated them. And uh, on the next shuttle mission, we replaced them all three of them. And uh, lo and behold, in uh, the 21 years since then, we've not had a hard drive fail. So um, what, what was the cause of the problem? Well, one of them was, and this is a, an enlarged photograph of the uh, disc. And if you've ever pulled a hard drive apart, basically it's kind of like a phonograph, uh, a disc that spins around. And in fact, there's an arm that comes in and retracts kind of like your phonograph needle, if you remember those, um, when it was powered off and then it was powered on, it would come in and it would start reading this. It would spin the disc up and start reading it. Well, what they didn't realize was that motion, if you can see my arm, um, was not properly damped out. So basically what would happen is every time you powered on the MDM, it would go bump and it would actually bump the surface and nick it and, and scratch it. And remember uh, that insignificant moment I mentioned early in testing where they would power cycle the MDM on the ground? Um, well, I got to see Mighty Mouse work, but also what was happening is this was happening all the time. And every time they did this, they basically were slamming that hard drive. So they were scratching it up uh, pretty bad. Is that because it was in micro G? Was it something because it was in orbit or is that just? That's, just a, that's, that's a great question. And um, I'll tell you two funny things about that. One was, uh, yes, uh, actually that isn't funny, but that is part of it. Uh, it happened both on the ground, but we think it was exacerbated by orbit. Um, and the reason by exacerbated in orbit is probably what you're getting at. You basically have a gyroscope spinning. So you have gyroscopic forces happening on it. So it would warp a little bit. And then, of course, that hard drive, that, that uh, armature would come in and hit it. Uh, the funny story is when I was uh, at one point, I had to go down the hall and talk to my Russian counterparts and try to explain to them, yes, all three computers really did fail. Please do not launch Tennis Tito. Um, and they were asking me some questions about how they failed. And we, we were talking about, and they were like, ah, we learned a long time ago to get rid of the hard drives because of the gyroscopic effect. It's like, thanks guys. That would have been nice to know. Um, just as before we move on from that too, just to keep with that Dennis Tito thing, because uh, 
what would have happened if you couldn't have undocked the shuttle? Tito was on his way there. The Soyuz was coming. Um, it had already launched. What would you have done if you couldn't have released the shuttle? Well, per procedures and flight rules, uh, we would not have been able to get into the appropriate attitude that the Soyuz needed to be for us to dock. You know, all these vehicles have to have a specific orientation for the, uh, the, the approaching and docking vehicles. Um, so we would not have been able to do that. We would not have been able to put the solar arrays in a safe configuration where they would uh, 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 not damage the solar arrays permanently. Uh, so it would have not been a good docking configuration. Now, if you ask Dr. Bob, what do you think would have happened? I think the, the Russians would have just come on in and sure. docked anyway. Yep. So. Hmm. All right, cool, thanks. Um, with the other two MDMs, it turns out they were all software issues. There was, I mean, yeah, the hard drives were scratched up and, and probably it was only a matter of time be there before they literally hard failed. Um, but uh, it, it was software. It was just the software was buggy and it was having trouble accessing it. And uh, that was uh, an interesting challenge because at the time, you know, we're like, oh, is it the new robotic arm that's causing it? You know, somehow the software usage, you know, there was so much usage of the robotic arm that but it was, it was just the way the, the software designed to access the hard drive was uh, just had some problems with it. So um, some lessons we got out of it. Well, this is uh, when I learned in, in the space biz that if, if an engineer or anyone tells you it can't happen, it can. Um, uh, space is far more creative than we can ever be. And in my other two talks that I, I gave to you guys, you, if you may remember, uh, I mentioned that, you know, as a, as a flight operator, I would spend a lot of time, all of us would spend a lot of time laying in bed at night, staring at the ceiling, worrying about what could happen. What have we not thought about? And that's really a lot to me. That's a lot of what rocket scientists is trying to anticipate it because Engineers can design things as well as you think they are, but until you get it in space, you can't always, uh, you know, just like the gyroscopic, the, the warping, the, the damage, you can't anticipate all that stuff always. Uh, you also have to be flexible. Um, you know, we had payload MDMs that had parts we can scavenge, and I'm not kidding. This really was like an Apollo 13 uh, moment in mission control, and people were running around trying to figure out where we had parts of things. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's also the team was flexible in trying to figure out we had never trained or planned to load software from the ground like this. Um, in fact, uh, I and a couple guys like 2 a.m. one night, we were like just playing around. It's like, hey, you want to play a trick on the software people and see if we can modify their code without them knowing it? And we were trying to load some software and it worked and we're like, oh, never <laughs> thought it would come in handy someday, but it did. Um, and the, the, after we had activated the lab, um, and those CNC MDMs were up, uh, the engineers folks, they were like, Hey, let's get rid of mighty mouse. We don't need that subroutine because that's something we're always going to have to test and maintain. Uh, and we fought really hard and said, Nope, keep it in there. Uh, we also knew the system. Um, I and my colleagues, but I had literally gone through every line of code in that computer. And I knew every line of code um, and that really helped. Uh, we really understood the hard drives. You know, we had played around with it and testing and knew every aspect of it. Um, so we really knew, um, uh, understood the complex system. And it's funny, you know, a lot of times people ask me what rocket science is. And like I tell you, we're using 386 chips. So it's not cutting edge technology all the time. Um, but to me, rocket science is kind of like, okay, You've got a Volkswagen Beetle from the 60s, relatively straightforward, solid engineering. Oh, by the way, that's 200 miles away. Now you've got to figure out to tell someone how to, you know, remove the carburetor, uh, and they can only do it with one hand without looking. You know, you've got to know it that well, uh, and that's that's how it works. Um, so we had seen the the, the Mighty Mouse. Uh, the engineering team did not even realize it executed at that time. Uh, it was myself kind of going through and looking at uh, some of the telemetry. And I said, hey, line three of the software says do this. And I see that variable set. So I think we're, uh, we had it. Um, and by the way, uh, I had developed a whole bunch of flow charts on how the software worked, including Mighty Mouse. And the, uh, the requirement specification was updated to use my charts. So, ah, uh, so let me pause there. 
um, before I get into the next stage of my career, is there any other questions on that particular story? Yeah, there, there was a couple here that uh, came in too. Uh, we'll start with uh, Professor Moshe Guy had asked that at uh, some point, he recalls that uh, NASA was looking for old PC workstations with DOS and floppy disks. And the idea is that they are still working and that they must be good enough for space. If they worked on earth, these old things, let's take them to space. <laughs> Did that happen, or is, is that a true story? Are these things still being used somewhere? I am not aware of that particular thing. Now, I will tell you that even up until the day the shuttle retired, um, folks were spending time on eBay uh, to buy parts, uh, computer parts, uh, I think PC parts, um, because a lot of the things that uh, launched and operated the shuttle was no longer manufactured. And of course, once the program was ending, there was no motivation to spend money. And uh, so, yeah, they were pulling parts, uh, I know, from old computers to try and uh, like the ground launch sequencer. Um, there were there was some cases of that that I'm aware of. So maybe that's what what that refers to. Hmm. Um, yeah, there's no other questions about the uh, ISS. It still is shocking to me that we could be so close to disaster with just three computers calling the shots like that, that that could happen so easily but again computers were not really all that great back then i mean they're not great now but even then more so back then and and uh it it's it's frightening that everything could have just fallen apart with just those three dropping no it can't happen <laughs> no, that that's a that's a great point. And, um, you know, one, it's a little bit of, you know, a, a case where like engineering was overly confident um, in, in their hardware and design. They thought that everything was OK. Um, but also we were more vulnerable in those days because we had a smaller space station, um, you know, nowadays uh, or I should say in my last days at NASA, when I was a flight director, when, when we were in simulations with new flight controllers, um, when uh, a failure would happen, of course, they would like panic and like, oh, my God, I got to do something right. I'm like, you know, it's a solid system now because we have lots of redundancy and capability and we've trained a lot more. Just relax. It'll take care of itself. But back then where we only had a few computers, uh, we had limited resources, limited power, limited consumables. Um, that was the worst time for that to happen. Um, before you move on to what you're doing now, maybe we could talk to it, just still sticking with the ISS. Um, the Soyuz has been smacked by something. It had some sort of a coolant leak. Um, we saw the crazy pictures of all that coolant leak, like snow blowing into uh, all around the ISS. And now the Russians have decided that they're going to send up another Soyuz as a rescue Soyuz. What can you tell us about that and fill us in on, on what's going on there? Well, first, I'm going to have to speak generically because one frustrating thing about uh, leaving NASA is I'm not in the loop as much as I used to be. Mm -hmm. um, but this was a scenario that we uh, uh, worried about for years. Um, uh, a, a Soyuz or also a, uh, a Dragon and soon a uh, Boeing Starliner um, you know, that's the vehicles that take astronauts to and from the station. Now, normally you only go up once and then you spend about six months there and then you come home. Um, but that's also your emergency lifeboat. So if there's a fire that you can't put out for whatever reason, and we've got procedures and reasons to think we could put out a fire. Um, if a piece of debris hit the space station and it depressurized and lost all its uh, atmosphere, um, or there was ammonia released from the coolant loop that you couldn't purge. Um, and the astronauts had to come, or they had a medical emergency, you know, an appendicitis or something. They would get into that emergency vehicle and come home. Now, we've we spent years uh, worrying, like, uh, what would happen if uh, the debris or something went wrong with those vehicles? Um, now, the station is shielded against most debris. A um, lot of it is small debris, you know, like the size of uh, sands of grain, a grain of sand. Um, but that still patches, uh, pu punches uh, quite a wallop. Um, but the debris shielding around the station uh, is you know, pretty strong for that. And then we actually have the, the station canted in a position that kind of puts the Soyuz in a protection, you know, kind of in the, uh, the wake of the station. So it should get less debris on it. Um, but you know, statistically, um, something hit it. Um, and the, the, the plan 
that we always kind of considered in that case was, well, depending on what the situation was, because uh, like one that we trained regularly was, let's say something hit the Soyuz or the Dragon and there was a, a, an air leak, but it was a slow leak, air leak. What you would do is the crew would get into that vehicle and come home before that air would all be too low. And that way the crew didn't, you know, you wouldn't have a case where the crew didn't have a, a lifeboat. Uh, unfortunately, they're now home, so they're not working on the station, but at least they're safe. Um, so this is a little bit different. This uh, what happened there was the coolant was punctured. So all of it leaked out and um, they're going to do some testing. This much I know for sure, um, because they're going to bring that spacecraft home. Uh, they're going to put some instruments in it because uh, the main effect of that is uh, hardware could overheat, like the computers controlling it could overheat, which is not good. You know, if you're coming in a reentry, you don't want your computers to overheat and, and fail because you could end up dead. Um, alternatively, uh, it's going to get hotter than hell in there. That's and what I was thinking. The humidity is going to be awfully high. The temperature is going to be somewhere around 90, 95 degrees. You're in this closed area. I just started getting claustrophobia thinking about how terrible this ride would be back if if they did put them in there. Uh, yep. 90, 95 degrees, high humidity, stuffed in there like a sardine and not being able to move and hoping that you survive. I mean, it's It's crazy. Yeah. And, and some of the analysis I saw was, was actually around a hundred degrees. Mm. Um, and, you know, you always have to keep in mind, well, that's your best guess of analysis. You know, what if it turned out that you were wrong and it was 110, um, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to function for that. So um, they were trying to figure out what to do. Um, you know, now, again, if your choice was to die in the space station or come home and be really, really hot and maybe have a problem, you probably in an emergency would still take that. Um, now what they've decided to do is send up a replacement vehicle. So they're going to undock that. They're going to put some instruments in that one, undock it, bring it home. So in the future, they'll know, Hey, maybe it wasn't as bad as we thought. I don't think that's the case, but you know, at least you'll know a little bit more. Uh, you can't do anything else with the spacecraft and they're going to put a whole new Soyuz up there. So then they'll have a, a good emergency escape vehicle. Uh, they're in the process of talking that if there truly was an emergency, could everyone get into the dragon and come home? Um, I don't know where they are on that. I know they're talking about it. Uh, you talk about claustrophobic. That would definitely be cozy, you know. Here, sit on my lap. Yeah, but you so. can put seven people. I mean, the Dragon was, I know, yep. the one that goes to NASA or the one that goes to the ISS is not designed for seven, but the the Dragon was designed for that. And, you know, I would yep. sit on the floor on that if I, you know, had to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Whatever it takes. But uh, yeah, I, I, so thanks for talking on that. It, it's it's fascinating. It is a real thing that's going on right now. So it's it's uh, it's top of mind. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. I, for, I, I forgot about that. That's a good one to talk about. OK, um, so let me give you a little update where I am now. Um, and uh, in August of 21, um, and really my last day as a flight director, uh, was the day, if, if you remember, I was working on the Boeing Starliner. We had done the orbital flight test mission in December of 2019 and had a major computer problem, a software problem that wasn't tested properly. Hey, there's another talk I could give you if you guys wanted. Um, and it, the mission didn't go well. And we spent, uh, you know, uh, what is that, a year and a half almost to try and redo it, uh, re update the software and some other issues. And then in August of 21, we tried to launch OFT2, it was called. And uh, in that, that time we had valve problems. The thrusters weren't working right. Um, and it turned out there was um, some corrosion and they had to take them all apart. But anyway, uh, the last time we attempted it on the launch pad and we said, this is not gonna happen and it's probably gonna be some number of months before we can maybe try it again. Uh, I said that uh, 17 and a half years as a flight director is enough for me. And I actually went off and became acting deputy chief scientist on the ISS for a little while. Um, my boss actually said this was um, some R and R for Dr. Bob after working on Starliner for so many years and and still having problems with it. That uh, they said go play and be a be a scientist for a little while, and that was fun. Uh, I got to authorize. Uh, um, various types of research and stuff, uh, and when they would go up on what what vehicle. Um, so that was interesting. And then in January, uh, uh, basically almost exactly a year ago now, um, I was selected as the deputy in what's called the transportation office. And that was in charge of all the visiting vehicles. And that includes uh, Cargo Dragon, Crew Dragon, um, the Cygnus vehicle, 
uh, the Soyuz vehicles. Um, uh, the at the time it wasn't flying; it had flown in the past, and it's going to be flying again. The Japanese HTV vehicle. All those vehicles were managed out of this office. And um, another fun fact for this one is my boss uh, was named Phil Dempsey. So we were Dempsey and Dempsey. Uh, some thought we sounded like a law firm, but I thought we were a, a, a crack operations team to manage these vehicles. <laughs> well, congratulations on the Starliner too. I think, you know, for um, all the years that you poured your life into that too, and to see just how, how gorgeous it was, the, the images that came back of the moon and earth and, and the selfies that it was taking of itself with the background of things and just the success of that mission. Again, congratulations on that, Doc. It really, it's a, it's a hell of an achievement. Thank you. Um, and then uh, in uh, March of 22, uh, a friend from Blue Origin called me and said, hey, I know you've been really interested in commercial space for a long time. Do you want to come work for Blue Origin and work on their lunar program? And I said, no, I'm loving my job. And well, wait a second. Let me think about that. You know, that, that sounds like a really awesome opportunity. So I crunched the numbers and discovered, holy crap, I'm eligible to retire. Wow. Um, so I, uh, I retired from uh, NASA and uh, started working at uh, Blue Origin. Uh, however, they said, hey, yeah, the moon's cool, but you seem to have a lot of experience on space station. And uh, we have this thing called Orbital Reef, and we'd like you to be in charge of the operations of it. Would you like to do that? And uh, I said, yes. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. And as I've told Dan and, and Franco, I apologize. I can't really talk a lot about Blue Origin. Uh, they're a private company. And... Uh, uh, unlike like competitors who like to tweet a lot, um, they like to keep things really kind of uh, uh, proprietary. So I can only kind of go into kind of a high level stuff, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about it. So what is Blue Origin? Um, you know, they, they have a vision and I'll, I'll be honest, I, I've, whether orgs or companies I've been with, they always have a vision and you always kind of go, okay, well, that's, that's cute. Let's, let's move on to real work. Um, but this is a vision that I, I, I truly believe the founder has and the employees that we, we, we've picked up uh, truly believe that this is where we want to go. Now, this is not something that's going to happen tomorrow, but we're looking to put millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of earth. Um, and I, and I'll, and I'll, be honest, it's not a trite thing. Uh, we talk it daily, if not weekly. Um, as we plan things, we're like, how does it serve the vision? Um, now, Blue Origin has a number of programs that are ongoing right now. And uh, a number of them I, I can't talk to you about. Um, but one, and I'll say a little bit more, you, you may have heard about New Shepard, uh, named after uh, uh, Alan Shepard. Um, Jeff Bezos is really kind of a, a geek in some of these naming things, as you'll see. Um, so this is a, a rocket where paid customers can uh, go up and do a short suborbital flight for about 15 minutes. Um, but that's a stepping stone. Um, we're also working on what's called New Glenn. Uh, this, is, this was a suborbital flight, so you can probably guess why it's called New Shepard. This is an, an orbiting vehicle, so it's called New Glenn. Um, and this is a massive new rocket that's under development to uh, launch uh, probably next year. Now, to give you scale, uh, I don't know how well you can see it. Let me, does this blow up a little bit? Oop, that didn't look good. We can see your mouse. Though. Okay. Yeah, that works, yeah. So let's, let's, so this is the payload fairing on the new Glenn. This rocket with the capsule that's not in this picture would fit in that payload, payload fairing with space to spare. Wow. So this is going to be a big rocket. Um, Blue Origin has done a lot of focus on engines. Uh, obviously, we needed some engines for New Shepard. Uh, we need even bigger engines for the New Glenn and the upper stage of New Glenn. Um, so they've been uh, developing uh, engines for a while. Not There's only a few companies in America that actually uh, build engines like Rocket Dying. Um, and uh, in fact, the Blue Origin engines, uh, you may have heard, are going on the Vulcan rocket that uh, um, United Launch Alliance is building. Mm -hmm. And then there's this thing called Orbital Reef, which is a commercial space station. Um, NASA wants to end the International Space Station by the end of this decade. 
and they want to have uh, commercial space stations up in orbit so that, uh, you know, that same sort of research and opportunity can continue on. And they're doing a commercial program that's very similar to what they did with cargo and crew, uh, the commercial cargo program and the commercial crew program. And what they do is they provide seed money to private companies and say, hey, we'll give you some money, but you've got to put some of your own money in there for skin in the game. And, uh, you know, if um, you succeed and you build it, we will come. And that's what they want to do. So they're, they're fostering uh, companies to kind of build their own space station. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll be an orbiting module, uh, kind of similar to the space station, you know, that'll be assembled over a number of missions. Um, and uh, that's in work right now. So I'm... Uh, in charge, I'll be, I'll be in charge of the operations of that. So right now, when I was a flight director, I should say, um, you know, we had a team at NASA that was in charge of the crew, you know, the astronauts, we uh, picked the astronauts, we trained the astronauts, and then we had the flight controllers and the, we trained the flight controllers and then we operated the vehicle uh, and we ran and operated the mission control center. So that's the operations that uh, I'm been asked to build for this program. So since we have a little time, if that's okay, uh, instead of the pictures, let me go to a uh, video. And here's uh, New Shepard. And I, you've probably heard some of this in the news um, because these do happen. We've had a number of these flights. There's a crew capsule on the top there with like six astronauts in there. That is not an artist rendition, that's a real video. So the way uh, New Shepard works is it launches up and uh, oops, to the next God. one. Weightlessness. Oh, Jesus. Carmen line. <laughs> the shaft. <laughs> no description can equal this. Weightlessness. This is nuts! Oh, my God. <laughs> this is us? Oh, wow. Oh, I'm telling you. Holy hell. Oh, my goodness me. I think oh, William Shatner enjoyed wow. his flight. I can't believe this. The look so, of him when he was done, when he when he got out of the, uh, after the flight, he was just, I mean, floored. Floored. Yep. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> um, so this, this is a 15-minute suborbital flight. Um, and most people, you know, they may have heard that this happens now and then, but, you know, having William Shatner go up, I think, uh, brought it to reality to a lot of people. Um, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Blue Origin, uh, also the founder of Amazon, um, has also flown. And you could see um, the trajectory of Blue change significantly after that flight. You know, he just was so blown away by it. Um, he, he's brought his... Um, the, the passion from that, that mission uh, into what we're doing. And then the rocket comes back down, lands on a landing pad in the desert. And it gets cleaned up and it gets used again. And the crew, uh, the capsule jettisons. Obviously, it jettisons and goes up on that parabolic flight into the uh, above the Kalman line. Welcome and then it lands the in the desert under parachute. Here's this is video with. Well, that's not his flight. That's Jeff Bezos opening it. But uh, here's the uh, crew coming out. So it's a pretty easy operation. Not like we had to do in the shuttle. Um, they just kind of walk out. There you go, there's Shatner. So that's what New Shepard's doing right now. Um, you can see that that's a great shot with the uh, rocket in the background there. So, um, and- when will, when will they launch again, Doc? It's, it's uh, are they gonna do some more uh, launches in 2023? Oh, absolutely. Um, if you may, <coughs> excuse me, if you recall, um, Oh, about four months ago, we were doing a uncrewed uh, payload mission and the booster experienced an anomaly. 
and they're uh, they're they're going through the investigation. I think it's uh, I'm not sure where it is at this stage, but uh, um, you know, it's 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 like an engineering thing. You find the problem, you fix it, and you fly again. So, how how many do they plan on doing in a year? Is that is that super secret, or is that something? I mean, are they going to try and crank these out and go all the time? Um, you know, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I, I think it's supposed to be fairly routine. Um, so Orbital Reef, uh, it's this uh, space station and don't feel too bad that it's kind of blacked out behind the words, um, because, uh, it's, it, it's just an artist concept there, but, you know, it's going to have different modules and, uh, um, be in orbit and assembled very similar to the space station. Uh, here's kind of an artist's conception of it uh, on the inside. Um, a key thing for things like tourists is nice views of the Earth, so windows will be prominent. Um, and uh, it's be a lot smaller, or I assume smaller, right? Smaller than the station ISS. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, the volume of these modules will be significantly larger than any module on the ISS. I did see some of the uh, kind of jiffy pop looking uh, Bigelow type of inflatable pieces on the side of that. I know this is just a rendering. Is that is that something that uh, is being considered too? Because I know that they flew one on the ISS for a little bit and they're certainly a great way to uh, give you a lot of volume in space uh, that you can pack right down. Is that is that something that's being considered too? Uh, I really can't go into that. Um, <laughs> okay, I can't go exactly. into design specifics, but... Exactly. Yeah. If you were to Google Sierra Space and some of the stuff they're doing, you'll probably find the answer to your question. Okay, fair enough. Um, I'll leave you with one last thing um, because in addition to a, a, a vision, we have a motto. Uh, it's Latin, gratitim ferociter. And to translate that, and it's, um, if, if you've observed blue from the outside, um, you know, I saw them on the commercial crew program when I was working on that, they were working on that a little bit. Um, you know, this is really kind of a root of it. Uh, what this means is step-by-step step ferociously. And, you know, it's, it's not to be first, it's not to be fastest, it's not to, you know, whatever. Uh, I mean, obviously we wanna be commercially successful and, and do a lot of these things. And hopefully we're first and hopefully we're not you know, uh, behind, but it, you know, it doesn't really matter. We wanna do it right. And uh, the organization really wants to do it slowly, meticulously, methodically. And uh, you, know, that's, you may not hear about us, but we're, we're tinkering pretty, pretty hard in the background. And I think that's all I had for you guys tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. There's another question here, too, from uh, one of our members. Uh, are you aware of any public owned stations to take place, take the place of the ISS post retirement? Or is the general sentiment that it's going to just be 100 percent commercial going forward? So is it going to be the world of, you know, the SpaceX Blue Origin? Is it going to be corporations that are going to put this stuff up anymore? I know we have the Chinese space station right now, um, but is the future of space really going to be corporate? I, I would say uh, the future of space in, uh, from a European and United States point of view and, and the Japanese, it, it's going to be commercial. Mm. Um, there's no, I think, serious plans to do another international government project. Um, they all are eager to uh, move on to Gateway and the moon and stuff like that. Um, but they, they recognize that they really have a need for research and, um, you know, there's a lot of research you can do in, in low Earth orbit that they want to continue. So I think there's strong support and, uh, um, you know, hopefully like the other areas, we'll seed the commercial market and uh, then they'll take over from there. Is there any other questions from our panelists? Is there anything that anybody want, wants to ask Dr. Bob? I guess not. It's just been, it's been the Dan and Dr. Bob show tonight. Yeah, <laughs> but, is, is uh, there any... Uh... Well, it's more of a NASA thing and, and you may not be able to talk about it, but how much friction is there right now with the Russians given the situation that they're in? That I can talk about, especially since I'm no longer a, a government civil servant. I'm not quite as constrained as I used to be. Um, there's a fair amount of, of, of friction. There always has been. Um, you know, some of it is just, you know, different people wanting to do things differently. Um, some of it is, 
you know, other challenges, cultural and stuff that uh, really make it hard. And I think it's been uh, difficult for, for many years because NASA, you know, they have very high standards for safety. And, um, you know, you can argue that maybe they're too high. And sometimes, especially early on, the Russians sometimes said, hey, wait a second, do you really need that level? Um, and, uh, you know, NASA sometimes over-engineers things, don't get me wrong. Um, I know there's the, the, the story of, you know, uh, NASA developed the Fisher space pen and the Russians use pencil. That's, that's not a, a true story. Uh, however, but I can tell you one thing where um, we, we took a, a, a commercial printer to the space station, you know, something you could buy off the shelf. This was supposed to be cheap. It actually cost about $350 at the time. Um, and then we spent probably $200,000 uh, building a zero G paper catcher. So that as paper came off the, the, the printer, it would not go floating around. Uh, the Russians took the same printer, said, thank you very much. And they put it in front of an air duct. <laughs> so the paper comes off and goes, thwoop, thwoop, thwoop. you know, now th there's pros and cons. Um, and I think uh, between that kind of friction and then as uh, their program has really been bled dry of resources, even before the war. Um, you know, uh, the government there had not been taking it as seriously. It wasn't as big a deal as it was in the, in the heyday. Um, if, if you've been following it, you would see that every year they suffered massive, uh, budget cuts. Um, and I think you're starting to see that, you know, a couple years ago, we had a hole, uh, in one of the Soyuz we've had more, uh, rocket failures in the last you know, what, five, 10 years than, you know, probably in the preceding 15, 20 with them. Um, so I, I do think that a lot of their systems and infrastructure is getting uh, on the edge. Uh, I think NASA folks are, are nervous about that. Um, you know, they're a key partner, uh, whether good or bad, you know, back in the 90s when a uh, station was on the uh, chopping block, uh, President Clinton said, hey, we're going to partner with the Russians and we're going to put them in the critical path, which means, you know, when, when the war broke out, uh, a lot of people were like, okay, well, fine, let's kick them off the space station. Well, we couldn't, um, they were in the critical path. So, um, you know, that, that just, we're, we're bound together and, you know, we're going to have to work through those frictions and those resources. And I know folks are watching carefully and making sure that uh, things don't deteriorate to a point that's unsafe and they got to be very careful with that. How, I've been told, I've been told that they bring. That? Oh, I'm sorry, Franco. Go ahead. How, how critical is the Russian module? Because that's the first module, right? It, it's extremely critical, and when I say they're in the critical path, um, the Russian module is the only one that has uh, thrusters on it. Uh, so if we have to maneuver out of the way of debris, or as the altitude of the space station decays over time, as happens because of atmospheric drag, um, they're the only ones that can reboost it. So if the, if the Russians said, hey, we're done, we're out of here, and they, they took the keys and left, um, you know, you'd have X number of months before you had to come home or figure out some way to magically reboost or, or do something. I thought the Dragon had uh, some capabilities to, to give it a, a bit of a boost. Is that not true? Um, okay, now you're getting into another area where I can't talk about. Um, All right, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> there, there, there's... <laughs> There, there's other options potentially out there, but you know, there's limits. Uh, some things were not designed to do things like that and may not be in the right location. Hmm. Um, one, one more kind of interesting thing about uh, Russians. I've been told, I don't know if it's true, it maybe could confirm it, that the Russians have guns and vodka on the station. Is that true? <laughs> um, they do routinely, uh, part of the equipment on the Soyuz is a gun. Um, and that's for because uh, they can land anywhere. They've got a huge uh, swath of land they can land in. And gotta shoot definitely, those bears. <laughs> yep. Gotta be ready for just about anything. Um, and uh, yes, uh, I, I, can, I can tell you that uh, uh, I even saw them, again, going back to the commercial thing that we can't do, uh, not only can they sometimes sneak vodka up there, um, and do commercial. I saw them one time at 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning. I saw them film uh, a vodka commercial. 
and they had the product in, in, in place. So. Wow. And I actually recently... used to have a, uh, a little plastic packet of vodka, which is what they, they use, you know, that, you know, so you don't, a glass bottle is, is a dumb way to take it up. Yeah. So, so Tom Cruise is going to go up there and film a movie. The Russians just filmed their movie. I saw the trailer for it, which actually looked pretty cool to tell you the truth that it looked good. It didn't look like a propaganda film. It looked hmm. like real. Um, so pretty interesting to see that. And then other people, obviously, other than Tito started it and lots of people are going to go in his path. So fascinating. See Tom Cruise's new movie. Um, yeah. And you know, sorry, I, I got to comment on that. That's it, it's, it's great to see that. Um, because I remember actually I was at NASA a number of years ago when Tom Cruise floated that idea and, uh, you know, you, you just imagine a number of, of heads at NASA just go, you know, <laughs> it's like, how can we do that? And, and why would we do that? You know, that's just crazy. Um, so it's, you know, you can call it art, you can call it dumb, whatever you want, but, you know, it's commercial and it's the way of the future. And I think it's great that it's, it's, it's starting to happen. I think so too. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap here. And, uh, you know, again, it's just such a privilege to have you as, uh, as a speaker regularly and, and, you know, our third time now. And I know that you have another talk queued up for us. And so maybe we can revisit that maybe at the end of the year, first part of next year again. And uh, I just wish you just absolute wonderful success at Blue Origin. I hope that you'll be able to talk with us about you know what it is that you're doing there a little bit more um, you know without being feeling guarded about what you have to say in the future because I think we just really want to know you know the world wants to know what is what is uh, what is Blue Origin going to do next? Yep, I would love to talk about it more. Yeah. So well, thanks to everybody again for uh, joining us tonight. Give it a like, subscribe to the uh, YouTube channel. And don't forget, uh, next month on February 21st, we'll have Professor Joshua Tan in the uh, classroom. He is uh, from LaGuardia Community College, and he's going to talk about how our galaxy was a quasar. So that's next month. And we thank you so much for joining us and uh, for everybody out there tonight. Thanks, and we'll see you again next month. We'll hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. My pleasure.